Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm here to introduce the next session, which is called Exploring Dialogue. And um, it, is, it will be held by Javier Gomez Rodriguez, a good friend of mine. Javier is from Spain and has quite an interesting history, and I'll just say a few words to that. Uh, born in a small coastal village in northern Spain, he heard of Krishnamurti, had some friends who had a connection to Brockwood Park, and as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, he made it all the way from Spain to Brockwood Park. And what happened there is that he met Krishnamurti, that he met David Bohm, that he actually, as a young man, was immediately immersed in the quality of dialogue which were opened up by, by Krishnamurti and Bohm. And that, of course, impressed him for the rest of his life. He studied after Brock, he uh, um, uh, finished the school at Brockwood Park, uh, studied in America, lived in America for quite a while, even in Texas he lived. And, and, <laughs> and he returned, he returned um, back to Europe, back to Brockwood Park, this time not as a student, but as a teacher. And again met David Bohm, because at that time, David Bohm, it was really the last years of his life, he died in 92, but in the years 1991, David was at Brockwood Park and had a dialogue with all the staff. We were at that time 35 staff, and he had every two weeks uh, a full afternoon of dialogue consecutively for a long time. And uh, that was really impressive. That was so impressive for him that instead of going back to the States and uh, going, starting a university career, he became a resident scholar in India at Vasanta Vihar just to immerse himself more into the teachings and into uh, the, the inquiry. And after that, another important chapter, he went back to Spain and started a dialogue group there. And it was almost 40 people, right? No, between 20 and 30. Between 20 and 30 people who met once a month for a whole Sunday in a monastery and did that for four years. And that is actually very important in a dialogue, that it is not just a one event, but that it has a development, that people get to know themselves, that the different styles, the different opinions can gather and that and become, in a way, open to everyone and common to everyone, create a kind of common consciousness, that in itself then leads to another quality uh, of exchange and of, of uh, uh, inquiry. And that was interrupted by a marriage and two children, but Javier is back today <laughs> to talk about dialogue. I don't want to say anything more and give him the space to talk to you about dialogue. Thank you. Uh, I mean, that's really funny the way he put it, from, from dialogue to marriage and back. So <laughs> the marriage didn't work as a dialogue. <laughs> which said some questions about the limitations of what we're going to talk about. But anyway, I think thanks Jorgen for that, because basically Jorgen set the ground for what I'm going to say and why this is significant to me. 
and I will try just to convey some of that. So the first warning that I want to give you is that this is not a dialogue. This is a sermon, <laughs> a talk, and uh, it's just a presentation really on the dialogue. It's not really a dialogue. I hope we will have enough time to be able to exchange a little bit because it's about us and it's not about knowledge necessarily. But yet there is some kind of background and one never knows who knows what. So do forgive me if I repeat a lot and I seem to be preaching to the converted. Um, it's not my intention, but I have no way of knowing what level each of us is. So um, if you get a little bit bored, just pay attention to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so the first thing, I want to, that's why the picture may be a bit puzzling, but if you look at it, it's not puzzling at all, right? It's good old Magritte the Dutch, I mean Belgian, um, surrealist painter who played with this notion that a picture of an object is not the object, the name of the object is not the object, and the name is not the picture. So those three, those three four things can always be split. So that pipe could be called house, could be called me, could be called the other, could be called whatever you want. The word is not the thing. So that's the first aspect that Krishnamurti used to bring across when we're talking things over together. And yet, at the same time, the importance of words as conveyors of meaning. And that we're all fundamentally in that stream of meaning, which is human consciousness. And that in that stream, all kinds of incoherences have developed over time. In fact, our history is just a record of those incoherences and that now, as representatives of that humanity that we are, it's our responsibility, if we want to take it on board, to see to it, to the extent we can, to dissolve, how far we can go to dissolve those incoherences and bring about a unified, cooperative and peaceful world. And maybe something beyond, like Kay would always point out and leave that door slightly open. But it's up to us to open that door. So what I plan to do, um, and the reason why I'm doing this, is because I ventured, dared, to tr attempt a summary of, of this whole thing in a little booklet. And this seemed to have sort of revived the interest in the whole topic of dialogue. Um, are you adjusting this thing? <laughs> OK. Um, it doesn't have, so ah, because of the echo. Is too much echo? Yes? Too loud, okay. We might too close maybe to it. All right. Could I, should I speak lower? Because I'm used to speaking a bit loud. Yes? Like this, a little low. Okay. Okay, I, I will lower my own tone. <laughs> so this is what I did. Uh, attempted a little summary by combining uh, basically I, I would draw from K, K and Bohm from certain texts of theirs and made a bit of a, what you call it, summary, really, uh, almost cut and paste, uh, an abridgment of what they were saying in order to make sense for myself of what they were proposing and to combine that with my own experience because I actually put it to the test. To me, when I came across Bohm's proposal, it made sense. That's all, it made sense. So I said to myself, it does make sense, do you do something about it or not, right? There's all kinds of things that make sense, but we don't act upon them. But I decided, I chose this road. Maybe it was a wrong turn, I do not know. But I chose to go this way, I'm going to experiment. Because what we're doing generally in the world, as far as I'm concerned, is not coherent, is not conducive to any right action, really. At the end of the day, the sum total of our actions is keeps undermining the integrity of our planet as well as of mankind. So that's a really profound issue if you want to take it on board. So I said to myself, hey, I'm going to die. <laughs> and what do you live for? You live for what you're willing to die for. So dare it, old boy. So maybe I will die before I get anywhere. <laughs> but this is the challenge, all right? So what I'm going to do is just take certain aspects. Krishnamurti talked about communication talked about questioning, talked about the nature of words, 
and thinking together. So all that really flows into the meaning of dialogue for K. He also defined it in some way, but essentially he split it apart. When he talked about the art of living, he had basically four arts. Normally only three are listed, but for us at Brockwood, students, for some reason, he was very demanding in that we should learn the art of questioning. I don't know why he thought that maybe as Westerners we were more dialectically inclined, but we were, and he always challenged us to think much more deeply than we were, knowing at the same time and always pointing out to the limitations of thought. He said, you have to think through these things. Oh, boys, you're not thinking far enough, he used to tell me. So, uh, all right, I've been trying to do that ever since. <laughs> so, I'm going to try it again. So this is his thing. One of the arts is the art of questioning, but he also called it the art of thinking together and so on, the art of dialogue. So that's why I entitled it this way, the art of dialogue. And art comes in with this warning. Don't be misled by the word. Don't be misled by the picture. Take hold of the meaning that lies, they point to and that lies behind them. Oh, wrong button. So communication. Dialogue is a form of communication. I think most of us realize the importance of communication in daily life. Our lives often depend on it because our relationship depends on it. It's whether we share meaning and can work together, in fact live together, whether the meanings cohere and whether really overall that is conducive to harmony or not. So I was surprised always that Krishnamurti was always starting with how you communicate, but partly that was because that was his problem. How to convey in words that which could not be conveyed in words, but yet, yet needed words to be conveyed. I will not twist that, <laughs> that thing any further, but that is the thing. So the mind or the heart, mind heart, have to appeal to another level in order to really begin to understand together what is meant by these words, what the actual reference are. And since they are inward, we have to be very subtle and very careful in paying attention to words and not be misled by them. So, unfortunately, I don't have the computer right in front of my face, so I have to also turn to look at the screen. So you see, to communicate, we must understand the words, knowing the word is not the thing. First thing, right? The word is not the thing. I may be talking complete nonsense, right? But you understand the words. But in order for me to communicate meaning, you must also understand them. So now we are using English. My English is not too bad, so we can understand one another. We cannot communicate if we do not listen with care and affection. So that's another famous phrase. All of this is evident. In many ways, all of this is too evident, maybe just to pay too much attention to, so I'll just read it too, through. Listening is denied when there is judgment, comparison, prejudice, desire, and fear. That's a lot of things preventing uh, listening. Prejudice, we can all maybe very quickly recognize. If I have a prejudice about, against you, I will not really listen because I already know who you are. And therefore, I read that meaning of what I have in my mind behind your words. You may be in something entirely different. So the observer is in preventing the listening. The conclusion that is already there is in the way. So we have to be able, <coughs> excuse me, be able to suspend <coughs> those conclusions, those prejudices, comparison, prejudice, desire, and fear. Desire. Well, how would that be? Well, maybe partly you can say, I want something from you. So I'm listening in order to maybe manipulate the situation in order to get that. That's going on all the time. Our commercial world is just based upon manipulation. So that's not listening and that's not in care either. Fear, certainly not, right? If I'm afraid of you, I won't listen because you are dangerous. Whatever you're saying goes to that place of danger and I will want to run away. Most of us listen through our background of knowledge, culture and experience. So there is another level, not the subjective, not so subjective as the other, if you like but now to the collective level of knowledge. What I know also stands in the way. I have certain conclusions and I listen through those. I'm certain of what I know and therefore I will not take in 
anything that will contradict or deny my certainties. Right? So that knowledge is a safety net, psychologically speaking, even socially, economically, we depend on that for our security. And that is a powerful psychological factor to hold on to whatever provides it, even if it is illusory, like a belief, like an ideology, like a national identity. So we deceive ourselves constantly by this function of knowledge as security, so-called. Culture, similarly, all right? part of knowledge, if you like, of the inheritance of tradition, what goes into making this identity. Experience, interesting, because for most of us, experience is also a factor of learning. That's how we say that we have captured something that is true. But it may be that the experience itself, becoming a conclusion, again, closes the door to a possible listening. And without listening, there is really no communication. So you can see that it's not just the word, the expression or the meaning, but the listening. How the mind, how open the mind is to capture something new and not to be trapped in his own preconceived assumptions, notions, and so on. So that's simple. Everybody knows. But do we know? <laughs> to communicate implies sharing, thinking together, and thereby creating together. You can see that happens, right? In relationship, when there is relationship, my feeling is relationship is communication at absolutely every level. When you say to your girlfriend or your wife or whatever, you know, I love you, you have that feeling of the, the love itself comes with this meaning of the meanings are shared. The barriers are not up. They are down. Of course, eventually they rise up again. It's like a little, <laughs> little what do you call it? Dike or whatever, you know, little dock, uh, lock in the, the, against the sea. But <laughs> the sea eventually will come through. So we have to watch that. But the feeling of love, the feeling of communion with another, because K takes it to the level of communion, is that the sense of the barriers that we normally have with one another are gone. That's when you feel love. And that doesn't have to be personal, right? Because it is something that goes beyond you and the other. It's something that has to do with the state of mind, state of heart. Right? You can feel it personally if you like, but it's beyond that. Right? And that's very important because we need that all together if we're going to work together without those traditional barriers and divisions. So that's very important. To communicate is to be at the same level. This is case, case definition, essentially. To communicate is to be at the same level at the same time with the same intensity. You know how hard that is? Yes? So, yes? Well, how can I explain it? <laughs> this is the case definition of communication. You and I, when we begin to talk over together about something, we are on the same level. You are not somewhere else. You are not in another, what do you call it? Wavelength. <laughs> we are communicating. My meaning goes to you as it is intended. Then your meaning comes to me the same way. And there is also the same intensity. You are just not agreeing for the sake of it, but you are writing the subject. There is a direct involvement. I'm trying to put substance to the question, right? And that has to be at the same time. It has, cannot be later. It must be now. So that's an approximation to it. I mean, don't you know this? Occasionally, has it not happened in our lives? Even with ourselves, by the way, this can happen. Our consciousness is a communication device. And it needs to communicate, first and foremost, with itself. And is failing miserably at it on a daily basis. But occasionally, that consciousness manages to communicate. Meaning, it's at the same level with itself, with its own thought, and with its own feeling. And there's no division, no duality. So communication has the sense of the meaning is one with the same intensity. It's truthful, hopefully, of course, because meanings can be also false. But it's truthful meaning. 
and it has that quality of passion in it, intensity. No, hasn't it happened to you that on a, on a given occasion you're suddenly thinking, thinking, imagine the great enemy, you're thinking <laughs> because that's the way what the brain will do, but that thinking is not fragmented, is not false, is not playing tricks upon itself, is at one with the fact and with the feeling. Word, fact and feeling, perception and feeling together. That's how it should be. But you know the problem with it should be. So, <laughs> so hold, but hold that. That's an important question, okay? Don't, this is just a verbal, an attempt and a verbal explanation. The, the, the answer will only come when you actually experiment with it and see it occurring. Then you know the actuality and the authenticity of this description. In fact, ultimately, Krishnamurti says this is love. That total communication, and it can be non-verbal also, therefore, see? That is the interesting part. It doesn't have to be always verbal. But of course, because dialogue involves words, I will put a bit of emphasis on words. What we share then is not words, but the perception of what is true and false. That's a major issue, to perceive what is true and false. Don't ask me how you do that. <laughs> but we have to test it, right? Part of the issue of testing the true and the false, one of the approaches is whether there's a contradiction or not a contradiction in it. It's a negative approach. If it contradicts itself, you can be sure something false is in it. So that's what I'm going to watch out for, just as an indication, hint. Such communication is not only verbal, but a form of communion. This is case thing, communion. Don't think of the church, but <laughs> the Catholics are always communing every Sunday. But rather of this human communication with one another is their communion, communion together in as one, right? Such communication, la la la, truth cannot be given to you by another. Well, that's interesting because we are hoping that somebody will eventually give us the truth. This is a major problem because it's an issue communication, therefore how do you communicate truth? It's a real issue and for K it was a lifelong issue. How do you communicate truth? Can you communicate truth? And he says, well it can only happen if you're at the same level at the same time with the same intensity in relation to the same thing. Bulu, we are not necessarily. So it's a great question for him. That's why he put such emphasis on communication, because it was potentially the way to freedom in which truth would be conveyed or would be awakened in someone. The perception of truth would be instantly awakening, awakened by the right depth of listening. That was his thing. That's what he put so much up. Why would he talk otherwise? He would have been silent and let the silence work. And yet he talked all his life while denying the significance of words so we have to, you see it's an art, that's why it's an art, it's something that you can't quite pin down to a, a mechanical system, and truth is the least mechanical thing of all. It requires instant perception. Truth is discovered by following the swim movement of what is. That's a major, major little thing of indicating something that is what is, what is, what is, what is, what is, what is, what is. So you end up in that little thing is the being in action unfolding in the moment of whatever. It doesn't matter what. So there's a kind of swiftness that is required in order to communicate. If we're going to communicate in truth, Bohm would come later on around and say, we have a dry dialogue or a true dialogue when we're communicating freely in truth. But you see the issue, the problem, to really come upon truth, right? It has these difficulties in it, right? Because you have to be able to follow the swift movement of what is. I pause because I go too fast. <laughs> so the swift movement is maybe too swift. This requires a quick mind and pliable heart without prejudice and identification, which, which I, prejudice and identification deny. The direct perception of what is is the beginning of wisdom. Well the beginning of setting the right ground for the mind to work on, otherwise it's working on illusion. Real communication or communion takes place when there is silence. Wait a minute, we're just talking together. What silence? 
Well, silence in a sense behind the word in order to perceive what is. So the word has to be able to keep up with this perception. And the perception is interfered with if the prejudice is present, which is the noise of the mind imposing his own notions of what is to be perceived. It becomes a little subtle. And yet I must be able to use words to convey that. The silent word in the beginning. <laughs> We're going almost back to a kind of creative state in which the word comes out of the silence because the perception is silent which allows the word to acquire a true content. I find that marvelous, but it is, it is difficult and it is subtle, right? You have to catch on to the speed of that. The simultaneity and the speed of that is quite, again, an art. <laughs> I'm a bit of an artist, so I kind of like that word. Real communication or community takes place when there is silence, blah. Then there is learning, understanding, and immediate action. Yes, communication happens when there is real affection. Well, af communication is affection. So it's just a way, a redundant way of saying the same thing. You want to ask any question about that already? Yes, because I want to get <laughs> to the end of my presentation. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Uh, wait a minute. Um, then there is learning, understanding, and immediate action. This is when there is the perception out of silence of what is, which the words can then convey. If we're both at the same level at the same time, we have the same silence and the same perception, and the words will not stand in the way. At that point, there is learning, meaning learning is perceiving what is. There's no learning apart from that, really, unless you're just memorizing whatever is in the body of knowledge. But perception really is the real key of learning, to see what is. That's where you really can ground your thinking. Understanding, therefore, right, that the mind captures the sense of that perception gives. And immediate action, that's what is always leaned on, that perception is action, right? That there is an immediacy of the perception and the action. Most of us filter it through thought, and that's why often action does not seem to take place. Yes, all of this is to be gone into for a thousand years, and maybe it's not enough. <laughs> that's why he's calling for the timeless to come in, because otherwise we'll never make it. Then there is learning. Communi communication happens when there is real affection between people. Well, okay, I that, had skipped that one, but this one basically is implied in what we but his definition of communication, which is to be at the same level at the same time with the same intensity, which he defined as affection, as love. So it's just a restatement in another way of what he had already said. Okay? Can I proceed? So Kay also had his own notion of dialogue. Uh, it was slightly different from Bohm, which I will also show a little bit. So for him, dialogue is an exchange of feelings. What are, it's an exchange. So when we're meeting together for a dialogue, what do we do, right? What is involved when we're going to talk things over together? So he says, it's an exchange of feelings, ideas, opinions, as well as of our human problems. So it's not like he's, he said we're not exchanging opinions. Well, he admitted that in his discussions. He wasn't necessarily, you have your opinion, so you have to bring them out. But we're not discussing opinions as such. It's not an exchange of opinions in the sense of I hold to my opinion and you hold to your opinion, and then we have a discussion. But rather, we bring them out, and then we look together to see, as we said before, what is true or not about it, if we can find out, that out. I don't hold to my opinion. Our opinions are intrinsically uncertain. By definition, an opinion is something that is not certain to be so. It's just an opinion, right? It may be partly true, partly not true, completely false, or completely true. But we don't know. So we have to t that, uh, treat it with that degree of um, hesitancy, not absoluteness. A lot of opinion, like belief. What is belief? You see, belief, um, it's dogma. 
See, the word dogma is very interesting. Look what happens when it can happen to opinions and how wrong it can go. The word dogma comes from a Greek, which means opinion. But what is a dogma? A dogma, therefore, is an opinion that is taken to be an absolute truth because it comes from a higher authority, from God. God said, and therefore, it is. Well, I don't know which God said or who was representing God at that minute, if he was the right minister or not. So you have to doubt it. Right? Doubt, therefore, becomes very important. Okay? So dogma becomes sacred doctrine, becomes the absolute truth that must be accepted unquestioningly. But opinions are intrinsically uncertain, and therefore, if you take them to be absolute, you are damaging your brain. You are creating the denial of intelligence, which is to question. The art of questioning is denied by dogma, which is an opinion elevated to the category of an absolute truth and sustained at that level by authority. An authority, like the ancient Greeks already knew, the argument by authority is the weakest of them all, because you have to assume that something is so because someone says that it is so. That doesn't guarantee any truth of anything. Okay? So problems arise when we mistreat these things, give them the wrong values. But still, we have opinions, and we have to look into them and why we have them. And even are we aware that we have them? That was Kay's thing. Are we aware that we have opinions? What kind of opinions do we have? Maybe we're just reacting, unaware of the opinions, the assumptions, the thoughts that underlie them. So it's very important to become aware of how our thought functions on the basis of these conditioned opinions. To communicate, there must be freedom, patience, and a deep demand to understand. Yes? All of this makes sense. Okay, so some of it I shouldn't even explain. Self-explanatory. We must be free to express and to listen in order to expose and inquire into ourselves. So that's interesting. Freedom to express whatever, right? Whatever is we want to express. So not to, not to, we, normally in communication we naturally constrain each other in terms of what can be expressed. Almost every context has a, a, a framework <coughs> of what is allowed, what is not allowed. Of course, sensitivity is always in order, right? And in this case, because we have a particular intent, if you like, which is to expose and inquire into ourselves, that requires a tremendous degree of sensitivity because someone may be exposing something completely intimate and problematic to them. And are we in a position to really listen with care and affection, which we can, we can accept theoretically, but do we actually have that quality to listen to another when they're opening their hearts, if that is what we are allowing each other to do? Okay, he was particular about that also, that we should be able to open our hearts. He even had the same metaphor. You know, he said, we don't listen to one another. We're so busy with ourselves and our problems, we have no time to listen to another. But it is important to open your heart. And maybe, you know, if you want to do that, you have to pay in coin to the analyst or in belief to the priest. But that's not quite what is necessary. Maybe, when you, maybe you will be able to do that to a beggar in the street. <laughs> so, to anyone, everybody has come to this point at some point in their lives where the heart is too full to bursting, is just too oppressed by its own content and needs to empty itself. And if there's nobody to listen, it's much more difficult. You just bottle up, people become depressed. So we have to also understand that function of listening and of relationship in terms of our mutual health as human beings. We are responsible for one another in what happens and the heart is a very delicate organ, not just a pump. And therefore you have to be treated with great delicacy and affection and care like a little child, which it is. We must be free. In dialogue, Questioning continues until all the question remains. That was one of case. that part of the art of questioning, actually. Kay was putting it this way, that the questioning and questioning, you know, this can happen. 
right? You have a problem. You are manifesting anger in a situation where it does not belong. And you say to yourself, what am I doing? That's not me. You try to avoid it. You use will. You try to say, no, no, no. Next time when I'm challenged, I will not react. Well, you know what happens, yes. Next time you're challenged, bloom, the reaction comes. It's a reflex system that's going on and that the conscious mind is unable to control. The conscious mind thinks it's, it is in control. It is not. There is a reflex function that carries on and just reacts. How do you get to it? That's a major question for all of us because it's a question of conditioning. One of the themes that we have been discussing is freedom from conditioning. But conditioning is at this level of the reflex mind, reflex system. And the conscious mind is not capable of accessing it directly. It has to find another way. One way to access it, as far as I'm concerned, is this. To question, 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 until you know you don't have an answer, but you still have the urge to find it. That energy of the urge, of the pain that is caused by the contradiction that is now present in your life, is the energy that can release the intelligence of insight, the intelligence of insight, whereby your problem will be dissolved. Because that intelligence, that insight, can access the reflex system. Hold that, because that's an instrument, it's like a surgery uh, for a healthy life. If you have a problem, just go to a friend, talk to them and say, I have this bleeding problem. I don't know what to do with myself. I'm just, you know, in pain and in a struggle. You say, and the friend will probably, if he's a friend, he will question you no end. Is it this? Is it that? Is it that? And you will be saying, no, 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 no. And you will go away from your friend in greater pain than before. But it is important to hold on to the pain. Because that pain is your urgency to find out. And it contains itself. If you don't meddle with it, that's hold the whole thing until the, only the question remains. But with the intensity of the urgency to find out, then the answer may, if you're lucky, okay, used to say, if you're lucky, the answer will come right out of the mind itself. It will produce it. You will see what unconsciously was at work, which was some thought that you had when you were a child, most likely. <laughs> In dialogue, question, Rana. Left, left untouched, there you are. Left untouched by thought, it has its own answer, for the answer is in the question. See, this is what I just described. The question didn't have an answer that you knew of, because the answer is internal, hidden, in the very operation of thought. And that cannot be accessed by the conscious mind. It doesn't know what is happening. So it has to be found by this way. And the answer is in the question. If the question is genuine, it has that intensity, of the end to find out and is not interfered with by escaping because we also escape right through various means so no escape is what he said he was a terrible teacher he said no escape <laughs> no hope i will not lift a finger to help you mama <laughs> but there you are that's the thing you see it's that's the actuality that we can't nobody really can help us maybe some people think they can and maybe they do i hope they do some occasionally there are real very difficult issues Maybe psychologists can do more than I am able to describe in this, my own investigations. But this is it. We are faced with questions which, to which no external answer can be given. The answer can only arise from within by a direct perception of what that thought is doing. Okay? That's why nobody can tell us the truth. Because we have to find it. Right there. It's in us. It's just hidden in the very movement of thought. Right? We have so many problems, we have no time to listen to those of another. Well, that's another issue. We create a lot of suffering by not listening to each other. Notice, simple issue in our lives. Families, home, partners, the whole thing breaks down. And society is, yeah, major. It is important to open one's heart. There you are, freely, without regret. Sometimes you open your heart and you regret it <laughs> because someone else didn't really, just reacted wrongly. You're in a very vulnerable state. So you have to be careful to whom you open your heart. Oh, what did I have? What happened? You opened your heart. I opened my heart. <laughs> <laughs> and the source went out.
Did it quit? Oh yeah? Is it uh, too loud? Yeah. Too loud? Okay. That's better? Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> yeah, okay. We're just finishing with dialogue. To open one's heart. So we're talking about opening one's heart. To be open is to listen to every influence and movement and uh, <laughs> what's going on with the computer. <coughs> We're affecting this computer now. Yes, I, uh, I, think, I think maybe the computer is telling us something, that we should just have a dialogue with each other. Well, it's what's going on, perhaps you can expand a little bit about opening one's heart. Yes. Oh, but let me ask you, how would you see that yourself? Because it's much nicer if we uh, begin to talk a little bit. <laughs> well, the, uh, uh, you just, uh, the, your previous bullet said that uh, yeah. the answer is in the question. Right? Yes. So if I look at it that way, what does it mean to open one's heart? And um, I think that implies uh, looking at oneself psychologically and, and uh, mentally, uh, emotionally. And, 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 uh, and uh, for me, I think it would mean an examination of what prevents, if I'm talking about opening one's heart, what does that mean, you know, like for me, what is that experience mentally and emotionally and perhaps even physically? Uh, with my breath or with my, my body, the tension in my body. So when I'm having opened my heart, I'm sure it's different for everybody, but when I'm opening my heart, what is my personal experience, both mentally, physically, and emotionally, and perhaps but, but, in my But, but what would you say much more simply? We open our heart is to just express your feelings. And to listen. And to listen well, well, to, yeah, yeah, to listen to them, exactly. That means getting uh, moving away from your judgments and all the little thoughts that Same. come up. I'm afraid. I am just in a panic. My wife is leaving. Whatever you happens to be. Or joy. I this got that, that. Just the heart, whatever I'm talking about now, just emotions or peace. I'm not distinguishing. I'm not saying it's an examination of yourself or anything. It's just that the feelings are conveyed. Open your heart. Of course, implied in this is that quality of depth, that the feelings are a doorway right, to the inner world, to what we are. They reflect, they are what we are. We are our feelings. Kay's thing about you are your fear, you are your pleasure, your jealousy, you are not separate from them. So the expression opening of the heart is to begin to reflect, out, sort of like by expression, to reflect what you are. venture out to say perhaps put it as a question would it be possible to say that I open my heart to you to you to you while I have not opened my heart to my own self to my own uh, shortcomings to my own judgments to my uh, own how, oh, okay you're saying you could be expressing your feelings to others and others could be seeing what you're not seeing something of that nature quite uh, in depth have touched myself my own feelings of what I'm feeling uh -huh. and, what, and that I have perhaps not have a love and compassion for myself so that I can open the heart to, to you, to the person I'm talking, while my own heart is not open to me, to this being, to this mental construct that... We're not in contact with our feelings. Perhaps. We're not, not even aware of our feelings. Uh, because you look, in Spain, for example, people in the streets is marvelous. You walk in the evening. And almost in every corner, there are two older ladies talking to each other. And they're talking about their problems. You know, my daughter-in-law, and la la la, and this thing, and the neighbor, and da. So you could say they're opening their hearts. They just need to express all these feelings, which are somehow disturbing in some manner, creating a disturbance in their lives. So they have to deal with it somehow. 
So they talk to each other at this level. But there is not really a questioning further as to why that becomes the, op the, the occupation of the mind year after year and what lies behind it. So the inquiry somehow is missing in the process. So would you mean something like that, that we can just go on like certain cultures, like Latin cultures, they're always expressing feelings. But I don't see that that so-called opening of the heart at that level really functions of an, uh, as an avenue of inquiry that leads to the unfolding of the inner. Yes. What you were implying so far is that yeah. dialogue requires a deep communication of freedom of oneself to be open to receive the other's communication, correct? So the mirroring, this is another aspect. You see, the mirroring of the others becomes important, right? Yeah. Imagine, just patience, right? So that the patience, we don't even have that. And notice how difficult it is to listen to another's feelings. We're not really very good. We can listen to words, but when words come with feelings, that raises the level of difficulty in terms of listening. I don't know why that is. Maybe it's because our culture doesn't value feelings so highly as just abstract thought. Exactly. And it's much easier. As, as modern people. But the question of, we see for example, I was, was always surprised, well not always, but I was surprised to find that when Krishnamurti addresses the issue of consciousness, sometimes he would begin not by thought, but by feeling. He said the content of consciousness is pleasure, fear and pain. I said, wait a minute, I thought consciousness was thinking, of course he means it connected with thought, right? F feelings, f pleasure, fear and pain as produced by thought. But, but the way to find out, you have to go to the feeling and contact the feeling and be the feeling. So this is very interesting. So in opening one's heart, that would be called for. The staying, the being, the be being the feeling and aware of it simultaneously, right? So that I begin to, that the inner dimension how I been put together psychologically and emotionally, which go together, have been constructed, and why that remains the habit that I have become. It's a challenge to the conditioned mind as a habitual mechanical device that recurs, goes on repeating the same old patterns time and time again. That's not a way to live, and yet that has become the standard operating mode of human consciousness. Is a major challenge that we have with us, the mechanical consciousness. And how do we even begin to see it? Yes. Uh, most of the time, thought is mostly to cover the feelings. So that way we show the what I, what I am, which is the I, thought. You mean you hide? Oh, you so, show so, me. so you show the thought by hiding the feelings. You yes. hide the feelings with thought. And then you show the thought, which is what I am. Yeah. You can see how quickly we enter into delicate terrain. Like, what's the relationship between thought and feeling? And how much the cultural aspect of needing to present an acceptable mask becomes also a conditioning factor, distorting factor, in the expression of what we are and in coming to terms with what we are. <clears throat> Maybe one of the factors of division psychologically that forces fragmentation upon us because we have to pretend to be what we are not. And therefore we are prevented from learning because we are not allowed to even begin to contact what is. Does that require a quality of vulnerability? A willingness to be vulnerable? Indeed. <laughs> and are we also able to be ourselves, the listener, vulnerable like, like the speaker? That will be a kind of love. If I care for my child, I will listen to them to the end. When I do that?
to the whole discussion, listening inside and listening to the other. But the quiet, there's something about quiet, quieting the thought, being present, so that it's possible to hear someone else in order for communication and for love, for love, that those are prerequisites for both. Yes. Yeah. But you can see that consciousness somehow has developed for most of us, very likely, let me put this forward, a proposition, which is most human consciousness are built on a nucleus of hurt. There's a hurt somewhere in there, around which a defense system has been built of opinions, of ideas, beliefs, and all kinds of certainties, which are just like the parapets out of which I look out on the world and I watch out for threats because I've already been injured right from the start. The nucleus of the hurt self becomes a powerful factor determining the nature of our consciousness psychologically. So imagine how vulnerable we have to be in order, because vulnerable means able, capable of being hurt, how vulnerable we have to be to dismantle the defenses and go right to the source of hurt, to the actual hurt, and meet it, be it, and hopefully in that wholeness dissolves itself. It's like, well, this is intended as a journey of wholeness, you see? Health, in terms of, if you like, recovering the lost health of the human mind, human consciousness. And to that you had to go to the source, and part of the problem is the source is hurt. So, you see how, but just trying to explicate a little more the meaning of vulnerability. It is delicate because it would involve your primal hurt as a human being. Very, very possible. I didn't go that far myself. But I could start with the psychological. Possibly underneath, because imagine what history lies behind us as just biological organisms. The amount of violence that history implies is terrific. I mean, when you, I only have to, I, I can't hardly look at nature programs anymore because, oh, love nature, love nature. Yeah, 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 yeah. But as my friend uh, uh, <laughs> uh, Raman says, it's just crunch, crunch. <laughs> yes. It's a, a very powerful therapy has come up where well, they look at seven generation impacting our lives. Yes, that's right. But just imagine, years goes generation after generation, see? Sorry, yeah. Uh, what is being said is gone. Oh. Whatever is a uh, volcanic group, whatever is there, I'm going to say. At this point, I will be open, uh, have there's a space to ask the question <coughs> at this point, in this person, that prior to his appearance, manifestation, many content, many consciousness, where communication, communion, all dialogue, all are the, in picture. I will be open at this point to ask a question that there may be a movement as it appears, as appearing at something prior to language, that's what I mean, appearing at where sense of self is not that obvious. So in this appearing at, as it appears into this appearance, meaning contact, contact. So when the question of communion and listening, would we say that those are the capacities somewhat prior to manifestation as such we call ego? Am I making some sense? Yes, to me, yes, but, but I think it's a bit too, too quick to go. I think it's a bit too quick to go there. We're, we're, we're jumping a little bit, though that was implied in what we said earlier, by the way, when you say that in order to communicate there has to be silence, but yet there has to be the word and the perception of what is. So there's an element of consciousness 
in which the self as content is not present. And yet that is the one that has to deal with content. That's interesting. But, 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 but wait, 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 because I have a long uh, list of... Uh, <laughs> it's, it's my problem as present. All right, all right. If you, I, hey, we said we, said we have to be free, <laughs> and I'm denying your freedom. <laughs> Because, no, 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 please. No, no, it's all right. It's okay. But look, um, as an old school teacher, <laughs> forgive me, um, that I always trust a little bit the sense of cover the subject to the, basic, to the basics of the subject. And then you can launch, kind of, in a more informative way, into the questions. If you allow premature questioning, that tends to make for confusion before it is actually necessary. So, it's only a strategy on my part, it's only a pedagogical strategy, that if we really go through the questions a little bit longer, some of these issues might already be clearer, and we can formulate the question more clearly even than you did, or than I do right now. So that's why, I mean, but I will try to make it short, huh? because this is much nicer. You can, I, I also, I enjoy dialogue, <laughs> and not lectures myself. So why am I giving a lecture? Yeah, I got it right, quite right. But let's just, let me see if, if I can be like uh, Speedy Gonzalez, and <laughs> since my name is Rodriguez, uh, I will do that, and uh, okay. Because these things were drawn from K, and to weave them together into a coherent whole is also a bit of a, of a task. And um, I've done that here, so I recommend if you can find a copy, find a copy, because this is much more detailed. Not to make propaganda for myself, by the way, this is free to the world, like uh, the YouTube, K YouTube channel. So you're welcome to it. But let's just go quickly, yes? Hold on to your question. We'll come back. You can hold. Oh, well, then that's so much better. That releases me from a great responsibility. <laughs> All righty. Uh, I will be Speedy Gonzalez, but that means you have to catch on. All right. Oh, there you are. See, there's always two speeds or three. All righty. Um, I'll go as slowly as I can and as fast as I can. <laughs> Hopefully we are contradicting myself. So where were we? We were somewhere without regret. To be open is to listen to every influence and movement within and about us. Okay, so that's just how wide is your awareness? Because to communicate properly, you have to have the wide context, more wider context possible. Otherwise your meaning is too narrow. So widen your awareness of the issue, right? Because otherwise you're not really open. And when you open your heart, also in what way are you really opening it? In how, what dimension of openness is that? Maybe just like the ladies I was talking about in Madrid, talking at the corner, right? They're not really. They need that. It's a therapeutic little device that our society developed to get rid of your pent-up feelings and your stress at home, right? By, by, by gossiping with a neighbor. But that's not the answer to the problem. You have to go further. Therefore, widen it. It's not your problem. It's a universal issue. Why these conflicts exist. To be open. Such listening purifies the heart. This is K, yeah? Cleansing it of the things of the mind. Really? But maybe, yes. See, listening purifies the heart. So opening the heart, if you listen to it, it purifies it. You don't need a filter anymore. You can purify your heart by listening. Maybe that's an, a general problem, that our hearts are not really pure because there's not real listening happening. Notice, at home, for example, when there is listening, suddenly everybody's hearts is free, are free. Even for a moment, right? And therefore, you see the relationship, how much easier it flows. You purify the heart by listening we never thought maybe of that, but the purification of the heart, which is fundamental, right? Because otherwise it's locked up in his own internal contradictions and ongoing miserable states. is very important. And he says, listening 
is one purifier. I like that very much, but then, of course, hey, it has to be done. Otherwise, it remains an idea. Cleansing it of the things of the mind. This was case thing. The heart is not functioning properly. Highly sensitive instrument that it is. Its sensitivity is being prevented by the interference of the mind. What he calls mind here is just thinking, conditioning, all those things. Notice that the heart is now being controlled for the most part by the mind. It's feeling what the mind tells it to feel according to the images it, it feeds it. Desire is that kind of function. <coughs> Fear is that kind of function. Right? So the pursuit, the three fundamental contents of consciousness, pleasure, the pursuit of pleasure, fear and pain, are produced by thinking, and that's what the heart ends up feeling, whereas those are not there. So the heart is being overworked and being misled by the mind, whereas there may be genuine pleasure, genuine fear, and genuine pain. So the confusion begins in a massive way, and confused lives lead to confused actions and all that kind of stuff. So to clear the heart, to purify the heart, is part of that, to cleanse it of the things of the mind that distort the authenticity, the truth of feeling. It is important to spend time together investigating our human problems hesitantly, with great affection, without pretense, without imposing our opinions on each other. That's just a general recommendation. Notice, we don't even see the importance. This is part of just showing the importance of sitting down together as human beings, to talk as human beings. We always talk as something else, right? As members of a club or of a church or of a psychiatric ward or whatever it is. Kishnamurti used to say that all these, all these groups are neurotic, no? Or the religious groups and the political groups. So, yeah, psychiatric ward, the whole thing. <laughs> so, no, but just human beings, right? We're concerned with our lives and with each other. Why not admit it? We care, right? For the whole. So it is important to spend time together investigating our problems hesitantly. We're too quick with our answers, not knowing what the answers are. So slowly, gently, caring, listening, famous cleanser, with great affection. Well, we're not going to measure it. Hopefully there is some. <laughs> but just care, maybe just begin with care and respect. Yeah. Affection. But for him, of course, he was that without pretense. The mask that you were talking about, no mask if possible. You can wear it the first day, but maybe the second day is best to take it off. <laughs> without imposing our opinions on each other. So express your opinions, be free to express your opinions, but we're not going to impose them on each other. We mean to establish a relationship, sharing our interests and major issues in life. I thought Kay was being very generous here, whereas generally he's very strict upon things, you know, not opinions, not the this, not the that. But suddenly he comes up with saying, yeah, you see, we threw all that garbage out the window, right? But then suddenly he turns around, and that's why I put it here, because I felt he was much more ecumenical, much more embracing of our f human fallibility. Let's just acknowledge it. We are there, and we can pretend to just, by entering a doorway, to jump to another state of consciousness. We have to start and look at the consciousness that we actually have. So he's saying, voila, this is where we are. We mean to establish a relationship. Relationship is actually what key. Communication is to share meaning, and there is where you're related. And you're related, not just in the, in the word, or the meaning of the word, but in the feeling, in the perception, in the mind and the heart, when they are cleansed of all those deceptions. So there you are, and we share. What do we share? Our interests, our problems, our issues, the major and the smaller. Some people get tired of that. Oh, I'm tired. So my friend of mine in Spain, after four years of dialogue, said, I'm not, if you're going to start again, because I wanted to start it again at one point, if you're going to start it again, <laughs> I'm not going to join. I said, why not? You were one of our old core group people, my old friend. What are you doing? We're going to leave me. 
<laughs> so he said, I'm tired of people telling their stories. But the marriage problems, how many baby diapers they changed. I really don't. <laughs> I said, do you care for other people? That he couldn't answer. So I said, that's it. What does it matter? That's their life. Do you care? If you, you, he had no children, see, so he didn't know even what I meant. So do you care to know what it means to change diapers and to have a child and how that drains your energy and what need you have of communicating with others as a result because you're totally isolated in that situation. <laughs> you are their salvation. <laughs> and you are your friend, then you lend a hand. Actually, maybe you go and change the diapers yourself. <laughs> but we don't think that way. We just dismiss. Right, these people are busy with the diapers. Jesus Christ, you were too when you were little. So I challenged my friends this way. So, uh, no. No, he was on to something else. He was already. He joined the, he, he joined the Rosicrucians. <laughs> much, much more of a secret, <laughs> the secret mission and doctrine uh, with promises of greater power in the esoteric realm. No diapers. <laughs> Though one, one of the village ladies used to make a joke. I said, I don't want to go to heaven. She said. I said, why not? Because it's full of little children. <laughs> <laughs> and all they do is pee on you. So they, were <laughs> they had no diapers at the time. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, there you go. Go seek the esoteric realm. You'll find a lot of angels there. <laughs> so no, you cannot, you, cannot, you cannot tell people, you know, where to go. The, everybody has to find their own way. You want to join the Rosicrucians and not dialogue with us about our normal everyday life and be human with us. You wanted to be a god. So all right, go, go. Good luck. <laughs> our life is the life of the rest of the world. This is good, okay. You are the world. We have made this violent society with our desires, ambitions, greed, and envy. He gets quite profound suddenly. We are the result of the fragmented culture. Therefore, not separate individuals. We are the world and the world is us. To change the world, we must change ourselves. This is pretty logical if you accept his statements. And Okay, so go, go ahead. This is not to be accepted. It's not dogma. <laughs> <laughs> but it's hard not to even understand that. Do you think the culture is fragmented? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Which even the word culture is problematic to look at that. What is a culture? Uh, say our culture here in the United States, right? What would it involve? Is it fragmented in any way? <laughs> just in case, <laughs> I, I come from another planet, so I'm just wondering. I come with this theory of universal fragmentation, but I'm always hoping that there will be a little piece of a planet at least where that doesn't happen. So maybe it's the United States. <laughs> you say, no, no, we're no exception. Well, well what is the fragmentation, for example, and how would it, was it transmitted? You were a native of the US. How do you think that may have communicated to you from the culture? Or has it? It's separate and fragmented are synonymous, right? And now you put a not in front of separate. What? Aha, aha. Wait, 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 wait. The right, right, right. The, 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 hmm. What I did here was uh, I had to kind of make one sentence. So I compressed a lot of stuff in the end. So there you're right to question it. There's a kind of missing connectors. Uh, fragmented culture, therefore not separate individuals. He, this is case, good old thing, of playing on the word individual, which means not divided, not fragmented. If we are the result of the fragmented culture, therefore fragmented, we are not individuals. That's the logic imp implied, according to his meaning, in that sentence. See? So, you understand? Individual means not divided, not fragmented. Individual, individual, Individuo, so dividuo, dividire, not divided. So the, the notion of an individual is, is like the atom, right? Not, cannot, 
divided any further. That's the notion psychologically. The individual is the last unit, the unbreakable unit. So society is made up of individuals, meaning there is one fundamental unit out of which the whole thing is built. My goodness, I'm going slowly. Yes, he, he used to say that. No, I mean, instead of being the result of fragmented culture, being undi undivided, so. individual, yeah, undivided. Even your state, your family, the religion, the school, that kind of sets certain patterns which more or less begin to shape us in a particular way, give us our values, which become the purpose of our actions. So even the way we act has to do with what, how we were informed, how the, the system, of, system of values we were given. And that's the culture, generally is the system of values, norms and uh, structures that are being put together in order for us to function together. Right? Well, that's also the definition of society. It's more like the system of values, really, that constitutes the culture. So, if you think that you, have, you are an individual, that tends to be one of the values of our culture. That it, the individual is very important. And as an individual, you must struggle to achieve. Right? You must fulfill. You must, I don't know what you must, you must do all kinds of things. <laughs> Yes, you must become, you see, you must, you must achieve. That's a Krishnamurti word, I'm trying to avoid it. You must fulfill, you must prove yourself. And the society gives you the standards by which that proof can be achieved, the measurements. So it conditions you, it gives you the goal and it gives you the means, and then you go. And then the society as a whole tries to harness all those individuals trying to get to this point of fulfillment for his own, for the collective good. That was Alexander Hamilton. The fundamental principle of human motivation is self-interest. And we're just going to create a constitution whereby we're going to harness all those egotists to the greater good. <laughs> he didn't put it that way. But essentially, that the self-interest is the motivating factor. And therefore, we're going to harness all that by creating a framework such that your freedom ends at the freedom of another. So you can't uh, be allowed to exploit beyond a certain limit the other and therefore we're collectively going to exploit other people nice no so even collectively we're not aware that we're participating while avoiding while calling human rights here in the exploitation of others elsewhere and we accept that because that's part of our security part of our becoming part of making america great again <laughs> Well, again, again is a great question, but <laughs> never mind. That, that you see how many issues there are just in a sentence, and therefore the whole, for me, let, let me just pause there. The whole issue of dialogue hinges on, is an experimental approach to the discovery of the truth, whether it is true or not, that we are the world. How did Krishnamurti, why did, what did Krishnamurti base, base that statement on, that we are the world? What evidence did he give for that supposed fact, truth? We all have the same fear. That was his, his thing. We all go through fear, we all go through pain, the struggles to make it in life, the difficulties in relationship, the struggles with ourselves, with our self-knowledge, with our etc. So if you look at the broad spectrum, however particular the experience may be, is in that universal stream of consciousness of the common consciousness of humanity. That's what he, pro I think that is correct. And yet, within that consciousness is this notion that each of us is separate. So how do you put the two together? Because we will come to the dialogue with that notion. It's me here, it's you there. You have your content of consciousness, which is your particular background. I have a different background, slightly, and that is sort of the upper layer, right? 
So that's the first sort of manifestation. But as I manifest my upper layer, the deeper layer is immediately coming through. Right? And we are kind of, it's kind of like holographic experience where you smash the great photo and every little photo, every little fragment reproduces the whole. So to see in the fragment the whole and by talking together, what we're doing, in my opinion, is reconstructing the whole. That's the main metaphor for me of what can happen in dialogue if we sustain it. But it has to be sustained over time. I conclude because otherwise we'll be here until the cows come home. And the cows are not coming home <laughs> <laughs> anymore. See, Dima. 15. Uh, I'll jump, i jump, because we said so many things, words, language, questioning, thinking together. You have to invite me more often. <laughs> yeah, okay, this is what we do. I will play the slides, and you can read them yourselves. Okay, it's quietly. Uh, for, oh, sorry, I'm sorry. So we went through this, yes, and then we were here. So you can look it online, yes? Oh, yes? 10 seconds. So that it can be watched in the video. Absolutely. Great, great, great. Yes, absolutely. This is free to the world. I am the world, so are you. <laughs> 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 Javier, yeah. is this all in the booklet? Are these? No. Okay. Is it on the YouTube or whatever? I can send it to you as well. We can, our... we, we can also upload it to yes. the YouTube videos. I have this as a PDF. Uh -huh. Okay, that's... good. Okay, so all right. you can get it directly from him. Okay. Oh, I went backwards. Can you go back to words and language? Okay. Just for no, the, the no. 20 seconds. I did. You did. Yes. We got it. He sold him a fundamental. <laughs> no, the idea is to read it online. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. So this I jump to Bohemian dialogue here because he has his own take on it. Yeah. That's an he includes all the other, other things. things. But then he adds something more. Alrighty, so that's it. That was the whole of it. Um, yes. So <laughs> there's not much room for questions and answers because the the no, one one word of um, just one word on Bohm. Uh, his idea was partly that when K was alive. He was the voice, of the speaker. He was the voice of truth in our time. And he spoke to the individual. The individual, curiously enough, being the representative of humanity. So a universal being. But the sense he had, it seems to me, maybe I'm wrong, but that's how I understand it. 
He, the only, he spoke to the individual, so-called, because only individual, curiously enough, this change can happen. While it is addressed to the universal consciousness, the change happens in the individual. That's another little glitch in our fundamental transformation, although that will affect the consciousness of humanity, naturally, because it's in the stream, and suddenly another chemical has come in. At the same time, it happens only in particular persons. So that's why he was always talking like that. Bone comes along and says, well, fine. The teacher goes, what is left? A bunch of individuals trying to figure it out on their own because nobody can give you the truth. And that makes for a certain, potentially, a certain kind of isolation. It's just your task. It's just my task. So Bohm says, actually, if we are the world, it's our task. Because we are all implicated and consciousness is intrinsically participatory. We said, he said it when the gentleman was gone, but he said, you know, it's that we share this common consciousness. We are that common consciousness and therefore the inquiries into that common consciousness. <laughs> the answer is... <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, I, Ida, Ida, this was the answer to my question. Very simple logic. The bone, bone was a super logician, and it seems to make sense to me this reasoning, which is that. Since we share the same consciousness, it's not an individual problem. It is because each of us needs to change and nobody is going to change another. And yet it is a common responsibility, universal of all human beings, to bring our attention, our energy, to inquire into this question because the problem is universal, has been there for a long time. Consciousness is stagnant, is stuck in a series of fragmented and incoherent structures. That's our common human problem, right? Is that the good old poem by Alexander Pope, you know? Know thyself, presume no God to scan. The proper study of mankind is man. That is, there we have to touch it, the universality. And the particular that we are is our concern as the universality it embodies. And that's our responsibility for the whole of the world, for mankind. That's what these places, in my opinion, stand for. And there's beauty I appreciate. And being in Ohio, especially <laughs> at this time of year. <laughs> so that's my message. But now we can have a couple of questions. Do we have a couple of questions? Conversations. How would you think the but you never know, you never know, even you, you have this belief that when you're in a certain state, state of heightened I energy, even the furniture cracks. Yeah. So I don't know, I don't know that I'm in that state, yeah. but sometimes en energies are all over the place. I suspect that it was not very well fixed, so I, I prefer the, the technical hypothesis like my friend Patik told me this morning, just look for the technical hypothesis before you jump to the esoteric. So I got this message, <laughs> and I'm going to use it. But you never know. There are a lot of energies that we are not aware of, and sometimes they operate. I'm sorry, I, I am a bit slow in, in, in uh, going through these things because I find they have a lot of content. Well, I well I have given you something to to do on your own, which is just nice. And please do take a look and ponder on these things. It's just our lives. Take this and really do it at the beginning of all dialogue series, because a lot of people come to these dialogues really not quite fully understanding these these principles. That I think would be not only very guiding, but it will help people have better dialogue experiences. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, that, that's why uh, myself, when I start these dialogues, I always make this kind of presentation. Not exactly this. This is a bit of an extended thing because I wanted to give a more co cohesive uh, overall picture. 
but something of this order. That's why I, I put this thing because some people, I had given a seminar on case teachings and people at the end of it said, uh, oh, but this, is it ending here? There must be a follow-up. Case teachings are an, an incredible and a wealth of, of meaning there, a treasure or an education to all of us if we really care to look and inquire. So these people were a bit frustrated that the course was over, the, the, the seminar was over. So they were, my goodness, am I responsible now for something? <laughs> for the frustration of the people. So I said, all right, uh, since I started with the metaphor that Krishnamurti's teachings, he presented them as the reading of the book of yourself, which is the book of humanity. Same thing, just a beautiful metaphor that he employed towards the end of his life about what his teachings really are. The reading of the book of mankind, which he called the book of time. I like that, because when, after you read the book, you know, the book of time, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. You know, so he brings it to that point of uh, looking at consciousness to the point of finding the utter meaninglessness in which we are living. And therefore, potentially closing that book, and like good old uh, Shakespeare in uh, the, the Tempest, throwing it into the sea <laughs> at the end, because the meaning is seen through and is found to have no meaning. And that's liberation. That's when the spirit can be released. <laughs> Ariel can go. Okay. Okay. Uh, if you like to stay until uh, dinner, uh, at 10 o'clock, I'm happy. Out there, not just to have for Amir alone, but I'm just curious. There are many of us here who have been present in many decades in the past as to why we called it Krishnamurti's teachings. Why, why was that not challenged? And why That's a good did we question. accept them? And why did he accept them when there is something beautiful like if it was a collective activity where we peeled the onion and we challenged it and we explored. Why wasn't it learnings? Why did we accept or expression. teachings as okay in our publications? I'm just curious. I mean, this is just a question. In this 50th anniversary of the KFA and all these things, as someone who's just come into this and I'm, I'm, I'm just, in some ways we are arriving into Ohio next month, but uh, in some ways being close to uh, to, to all this uh, from back in the 80s, remotely from India. Um, but now just discovering intimately through Karen and through others and Mark and Asha, Nandini, my wife, and I just feel like why did we not put a break on that and why did we alert? Because it just seems so dissonant. Well, what is dissonant about it? I think it does. In case not asking by, by calling, you see that K had the problem. They had the problem of what call it. Because once you have a body of work, you generally have to call it something. <laughs> I suppose K didn't, might have preferred not to call it anything because the word becomes the thing. That's just the issue. Then we argue over the word because for us the word is the thing. We don't look past the word. That is the first, the beginning of our presentation. You have to look past the work. You want to put a brick on it. I think that's a bit of a pretty, I don't know, do you think it is an insect or something? There must be no, no bricks. We're not putting any bricks. They had a problem what to call it. They said, all right, teaching sounded a bit traditional. So they had a bit of a question about it, the Buddhist teachings, the, the, the teachings, all kinds of teachings are out there. So they had a bit of a reticence using that word. So they said, we'll call it works. I even heard recently somebody saying, I prefer work for Krishnamurti's thing rather than teachings. But actually, K himself rejected it. K himself rejected the word work. 
because it looked too ordinary, like public works. So he said, no, not works. So he accepted teachings, like he accepted many words, knowing that the word is not the thing. You have to really study the teachings. You are new to the teachings. You have to study the teachings before you react to them. You have to go past that word, that hang up about the word, and look at the teachings, and you'll see the beauty, and you'll see that word will not appear in your mind at all, because something much richer is behind it. Don't, don't stop at the door, because the door says, you know, this is a door, and it's closed. No, this door is not closed by a label. No label closes this door. It's you, and your interest in your life, and in the meaning of existence, that will open that door and case there, to open it also with you. I think, uh, I think um, for me on my side, you know, I can't remember anything my teacher Maybe said really. Um, but I think uh, what I learned from the teachers, they inspired me to to reach out and find something. I think with with Christian Murdy, he he's a person that inspires you to go out and to to find that answer. I think okay. that's what his his main vibe was. Is to become a, an adventurer. Yeah. In your own life, take your own life as the adventure that it is. You have a lot to discover. Truth is still to be discovered. You know what he used to say? Christ was, what, what, Bohm used to say something like this. We're waiting uh, what for Christ. They say Christ was born, but I think we're still waiting <laughs> for him. Meaning, it has to be all mankind, and that is all our responsibility. One person alone makes a great difference, but is not enough. And therefore, that's our responsibility. But those teachings are there to open, hopefully, if we, are care, if we care for it, if we give it the energy and attention required to open those windows of perception into the darkness that we have become to ourselves. So you, you, you connect a little bit with that, or...? Not a, something that I have any conflict. It's just a, something that came up. It's an observation. It's an observation. That's you, you, you should talk to your father-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> Every day for the next six months. <laughs> Why did you dedicate your life to this? Since it is something I want to put a brick on. <laughs> changing the name, maybe because some people won't go in there if they already, if they hear this Krishnamurti teaching, yes. ah. they will be like, oh no, exactly. but, but, but those people, do you think they will go into it if, if you change the name? Didn't you start there, the word is not the thing. The word is not the thing. <laughs> you know, I found a solution to, the, to Islamic terrorism. I should, I should convey this to the CIA. And they would stop all those drones immediately because the terrorists, if they understood, they would stop the terrorism. And in fact, most people would stop all their violence. And it's this. Whatever picture you are intolerant of, you put it up and you say, this is not what you think it is. <laughs> A picture of Mohammed, they killed for it, remember? For the representation of Mohammed, because it is forbidden in Islam. So go ahead, represent Mohammed, and then you put down underneath, this is not Mohammed. You are taking images for facts when they are not facts. And we're killing for that delusion. And we're doing so at so many levels, like nationalism, religion, the whole lot. This is not a pipe. We keep that in mind. That the thing, the word is not the thing. If people are put off by words, is that they are not really caring about the thing and they don't have the urgency to go past the word. And that is a lack of seriousness concerning the real issues in life. Anything else? I'm sorry, I preach a little bit. <laughs> Because Krishnamurti teaching me for them is like a, a sect, some kind of some guru or something, and they don't want to go in. Association. Asos they associate. The, the school here had that problem initially. They got the Krishnamurti school, 
And he said, but the, the word Krishnamurti might put people off. So they call it the Old Grove School. So they, 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 just to avoid that possible reaction. But look at how we are reacting to words. There you are, the whole issue of words, how important it is in terms of understanding ourselves. We have to watch how conditioned, how motivated, how, yeah, programmed we are by words. That's the first thing to challenge. Go beyond the word. The word is not the thing. Ceci n'est pas une pipe. <laughs> Ceci n'est pas une pipe total. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. But look, there's also a little chapter on words. That's why I put that chapter there. You see, I'm, my presentation is incomplete. Is that available here? Uh, he, ha he has... He has The booklet, uh, I don't, I, there were some copies there, and, and, and where the books are, where the books are, but you can have my copy. No, sorry.